Good morning and welcome to our crypto series. The second in the series is called Crypto Profit, Crypto Philosophy. We are joined by Legacy Club's resident crypto expert, the crypto professor Peter Bryant and, and Legacy Club member. You'll find on the right hand side, you've got Peter's LinkedIn. Feel free to connect with Peter. Um, he is super knowledgeable in this space. This is everything he does. Um, our last event, uh, Peter will go over uh, just briefly when we start, uh, but it was massively well received, a uh, huge audience for it. And uh, I believe that it's been really, really uh, well taken up and Peter's had some great feedback on that too. My name is Chris Caffrey. I'm the founder of Legacy Club, a first of its kind entrepreneurs community. This is the second installment in the series discussing why the news myths and prices don't matter. Peter will be sharing some amazing insights into the often misunderstood and mysterious world of crypto. Regardless of you being a seasoned pro or first time crypto investor, Peter's inside track is valuable. So stick around to the end. If you've got any questions, please feel free to use the raised hand or the Q&A icons at the top of your screen. Uh, feel free to use the chat function to share your contact info, say hello, um, and I'd like to wish, put a warm welcome to all Legacy Club members and, of course, our partners, Old Bond Store, and any first-time Legacy Club event attendees. Uh, we're going to begin now. I'm going to hand over to Peter. I'd just like to say thank you again for joining us, and over to you, Peter. Thank you very much, Chris. Yes, uh, so I did a talk um, around about two, three months ago now on cryptocurrencies and where they were then. And there couldn't really be much of a contrast or much more of a contrast between what happened then, and what happened now. Then everything was at all time highs and exceeding those all time highs by hundreds of percent. Now we're in a little bit of a breathing space in terms of cryptocurrency. We're taking some time off. Um, other assets are appreciating elsewhere and the market has kind of shifted a little bit. There will always be consolidation in all markets and some people who invest in cryptocurrencies tend to forget that periods of consolidation don't necessarily mean the market is dead or not doing anything. It's just a healthy reaction. So I'm going to be talking a little bit today a little bit more broadly than I was last time. Last time it was about the technology, it was about um, why cryptocurrency was important. Um, and how to basically get started. This is more about the philosophical uh, paradigm that backs up cryptocurrencies or that people think about when they think about cryptocurrencies and why the news, myths and prices don't actually fundamentally matter as long as you have a philosophy which is similar to the way that I invest. Um, and I'm sure there'll be a few surprises along the way. So um, I'm just gonna give you a brief backdrop um, that helps explain a couple of things that I'm going to be alluding to throughout this talk. OK. So I'm going to make a number of assumptions in this talk. OK. And I don't know whether these assumptions are 100 percent correct or half correct or whatever. But these are the assumptions I'm working with. Money, like anything, follows the relationship of supply and demand. So when there is apparently a lot of something, it is perceived to be less valuable and vice versa. OK. Supply and demand rules many markets throughout the world. In fact, it runs all markets, arguably. The general population is currency technology agnostic. And what that means is as long as the majority of people can pay for goods and services in a convenient way, most people don't really care about how it, it's powered. They don't really care about how it works beneath the surface. Just like when you're getting your car, as long as it's working, we don't really mind. Um, the moment it goes wrong, that's when we start to think, oh, hang on a second, what's going on here? Whether it be a government that is promising the value of that money or to bear the sum of that money, or it's a cryptographically secured, decentralized, autonomous network, which is moving towards the crypto space. And the, the demand for money will increase over the next few years as the population who uses that money increases. So the more populous, the more money is needed and vice versa. And also the underprivileged in the world as they come on board with technology, which is something that Starlink, etc., are promising to deliver, then there's gonna be a massive um, a demand for money and technology products more than there ever has been throughout history. Okay, I've got a couple of charts just to demonstrate that. So the world is becoming more populated, 7.7 uh, .7 billion people on the planet as we speak. And that's probably going to top out this century at somewhere between just under 10 billion and 12 billion, depending on how things go um, reproduction wise with people having children, etc. Okay, so there is growth all over at the moment, and that is also reflected in gross domestic products of countries. We are currently around about $12.5 uh, trillion 
uh, in terms of market capital around the world. And that is going to grow and grow and grow. And obviously, we've added, you know, a huge amount in the last 25, 30 years as more as economies have become more developed and uh, money has obviously uh, become cheaper. And we can demonstrate that with this. This is the value of mainstream fiat currencies against gold. And what you notice is systematically they all are seriously uh, depreciating in value. Uh, money is getting less powerful, fiat money, so dollars, euros, yen, um, pound, obviously. Um, they're all depreciating massively against a static value of gold, which is obviously fluctuating. But against those, it doesn't really pale in comparison to what those fiat currencies are actually reducing by. OK, and that is a worldwide issue. OK, that affects all fiat currencies. OK, so let's add COVID. And I'm particularly topical at the moment as I do actually have COVID today. Um, I came down with it last week and I've been testing and self-isolating and um, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's luckily I'm double jabbed, so it's all good. Um, I basically just have mild hay fever. Um, that's OK. Um, and I'm obviously still able to talk and do everything. I do have some water if I decide to have a coughing, coughing fit. But if we add COVID to that situation, 21 percent of all US dollars were printed in 2020. Um, that's a hideous amount of uh, money printing. And we also have uh, the housing crisis, which you can see back in uh, 2009 that the papers and everyone was really going for. Uh, COVID-19 is exponentially bigger than that as a financial problem. But obviously the health problems, the health concerns have dominated this narrative. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about narratives later. But the health narrative has definitely taken uh, precedent. The economic uh, has started to become more prevalent in the UK. Uh, if my UK audience are watching, we've actually just reduced all our restrictions. OK, but the data doesn't say that's a good idea. But the economy is what's winning at the moment in the narrative in the UK. Maybe in other parts of the world, the health conscious concern is still there. But there's this dichotomy between economy and health. And they do this all the time. OK, the economy situation is probably going to lasts a lot longer than the health uh, problem, which is obviously a good thing from a health perspective, but not so great if you are investing or if you're worried about your pension or you're worried about house prices, etc. So it's equivalent to what we've done here. OK, so fiat currency is a diamond that someone gives to you. OK, it's uh, you know a gift or it's uh, something like that. And you're you're if you're told it's the only one in existence. It's really rare. It's really valuable. You know, no one else has this. OK, you alone have it. And that's all that matters. OK. And then a few weeks go by and you see this and you think, ah, uh, are they are they copies? Are they counterfeits? No, they're the genuine article. What does that do to your perception of the diamond that you were given? It plummets. OK, because you now realize that it's not a unique thing. It's not a one off. It's not, uh, you know, it's been mass produced. It's been um, completely um, it's a commodity, basically, in the day. OK, and that's what we're getting towards with money is it's being printed so and so much that the actual underlying promise is starting to look a little bit more like a joke every single time more money is printed because governments cannot legitimately keep their promise to pay the bearer of the sum if everyone decided to cash their money in for bonds or for commodities or something like that. It literally there's no way we'd be able to, as a government or governments around the world, would be able to legitimately repay everyone. OK, so the idea that money has value is a little bit of a uh, non sector at the moment. OK. So this is the central theme of my talk today, uh, crypto as info or money as crypto and why money is now just information. Again, I put again because during the 16th, 17th centuries, uh, earlier than that, even we had a system where money would be ledger to be tracked on a ledger system and you'd go to your local butchers or your local um, you know, markets and you wouldn't necessarily exchange anything at the point of service, but you would exchange a service. So if I were a, a blacksmith, I would go and exchange my services for 
some meat, you know, and a ledger system would be kept by a scribe or someone who could write or uh, read. Um, and they would keep track of that information. And ba basically, over the course of many years, it would, it would balance out. OK, so we'd have an economy, but we wouldn't have a unit of value within that economy other than services as value products. OK, and this is where we're slowly starting to head again, apart from the fact that we obviously need a token or we need something to represent value. Um, rather than just exchanging goods and services, because goods and services are obviously in our uh, lifetime extremely prevalent and extremely wide and varied. OK, um, if I wanted to swap something with someone else who didn't want it, then I wouldn't be able to buy what they wanted. OK, and obviously everything is extremely niche nowadays. We're following the long tail pattern effectively. OK. So let's go back to 1900 and think of a question that someone might have asked. So who invented the light bulb? OK, now, obviously, everyone knows the answer these days because it's been in history textbooks throughout, you know, the, the last century since it was invented in 1879. Um, but if you wanted to know that information back then, you you had to go to the patent office or rely on word of mouth or books or news or general knowledge or school. OK, the point being, there were a lot of cor uh, corroborative sources for bits of data. OK. Now, today, what do we do when we have a question we want the answer to? We just go to Google, OK? And then Google corroborates it for us, OK? Now, Google might have several sources, or it might just have one source. We're not really told, OK? But if I wanted to find out who invented Ethereum today, which is something that many people might not know, then they will just go to Google, and up comes the answer, Vitalik Buterin, straight away, OK? It's common information today that has a single point of reference, thanks to technology. Companies like uh, Google synergize and synthesize vast amounts of data and present it to us in a way that we can comprehend and understand. We think they're doing a great job for us, but as has become prevalent a little bit over the last couple of years, we're aware that there are bubbles and pockets of information that are being uh, either avoided or heavily uh, demanded upon us. And that's not necessarily their fault. It's that we like to confirm our own beliefs. So we search for things that um, reaffirm those beliefs. OK, you're not going to type in something that you don't necessarily believe um, all of the time. So you're going to look for stuff that reinforces your belief. This is why I, as a cryptocurrency investor, have to keep my toes uh, in mainstream markets as well, because I don't want to become too biased towards cryptocurrencies and forget that there actually are many other products out there and many other investment vehicles out there. It's just that I happen to have a personal passion for cryptocurrencies. And then businesses, when the Internet came around, businesses that used to monetize common information in the 70s and 80s suffered as a result because they couldn't compete. OK, it was no way they could compete with the technological advances that happened to their industry. So I'm talking about the big London A to Z maps, OK, which still exist, but they have rapidly declined in sales. Yellow Pages stopped producing in 2019, had its best year in 2004. It was sold to BT in 2001 for 2.1 billion. And then Blockbuster, uh, which had a peak of $5.9 billion per year in 2004. So these services, these companies are now this. Google Maps, free. Don't need to pay anything. Uh, when's the last time you went on a journey? Probably not uh, very, very recently. Uh, Google made $147 billion in 2020, all of it from advertising. It's doing the same job that Yellow Pages did, just on massive scale, 24-7 worldwide. Um, and the business model is a lot easier than posting, you know, 1,000 page books up and down the country. Um, and Netflix has beaten Blockbuster's quarterly profits since 2015, $1.5 billion every single month, at least. And obviously, because of the pandemic, I wanted to make sure that that figure wasn't biased towards the pandemic. But since the pandemic, it's just got better and better and better from that perspective. OK, interestingly, if Blockbuster was still around today, I don't think it would have been able to have been open uh, during the pandemic. I think it would have been shut because obviously you can't share media uh, house to house etc so interestingly how these uh, how these uh, technological products have solved more than one problem and also been hugely profitable so what happens to finance finance uh, information is money okay that's historically been a massive problem until 2008 when bitcoin came around and suddenly we we're able to digitize value okay up until that point these guys had a monopoly there was no one else who could legally 
uh, create money, okay, because it was against the law, and there was no way that someone could actually send money digitally or electronically without using one of these guys, okay? Today, after a decade, so remember, there's not very much time in the grand scheme of things, uh, we've got these, which are Nexo, which is a cryptocurrency bank. It's got 12 billion in assets under management. Uh, we've got uh, Crypto.com, which has over 10 million customers, myself included, and we have uh, Celsius, which has 10 billion in assets under management. These companies are able to offer double digit interest rates because they're not uh, using middlemen. They're not using massive buildings. They're not using, you know, have to, they have to do all the compliance because the compliance is done by the network as opposed to, you know, three, four hundred, five hundred people sat in an office uh, looking through passport photos to make sure you are how you say you are. OK, the credentials are done by the network as opposed to having to be done by a human. OK, um, among many other things. Some might say it's already happened. This is the market capitalization of the biggest banks in the world compared with cryptocurrencies. And as you can see, uh, if it were just Bitcoin, Bitcoin is bigger by market capitalization than JP Morgan Chase, Bank of America. Uh, almost combined that's obviously reflecting the current price action as well okay when my original talk went out my first talk went out uh they would have been it was bigger than the world's largest four banks okay so obviously because of the price fluctuations it is a little bit uh man maneuverable but then ethereum as well uh is up there as well so if you take that actually the the grand market capitalization it's worth around about the same as 125 banks in the world. Okay, the assets under management are 125 banks. So this is something that is genuinely big. Okay, it's not a nascent industry. It's not a niche industry. Okay, it might not be that many people have heard about it, or that if they have heard about it, they think the wrong things about it, which is what I'm going to get to in a minute. But um, this is not a you know a fly by night situation. Okay, this is a genuine. Uh, circumstance that is akin to the internet it's just that we're in 1995 as opposed to 2021 in terms of cryptocurrency technology and where we're going and the mass movement has not yet begun it started with ultra high net worth individuals and high net worth individuals and trickled down to some individuals who are not high net worth but the majority of people who are just living their lives don't use cryptocurrency at the moment there's around about 100 million in the world and obviously as i said earlier that has room to go grow are going to be over 70 times over the next 10 to 20 to 30 years maybe even 80 to 90 times with population growth so crypto is the transfer of value money as if it were information okay that's the that's the parentheses that i want to take away from this talk crypto equals information which equals value okay so what's quicker a plane or electricity a few years ago, a prominent crypto company started a study to see whether modern banking was quicker than flying physical money around the world. And unsurprisingly, they found that in most international banking transactions, it was quicker and sometimes cheaper to physically fly the money to the recipient than use modern banking. Today, anyone can send any amount of value via cryptocurrencies for usually a lot less than £50 or $75. That's only at the peak of Bitcoin's uh, rate. So arguably, it's not dependent on the amount of crypto you send either. So you could send, you know, 20 grand and it would only cost you £50. If you wanted to send it via the traditional banking route, you'd pay a percentage fee. OK, so that might be two, three, four percent. OK, but obviously it scales. Uh, so if you're sending a million, you know, if you're buying a house or whatever, uh, then you're going to be paying a percentage fee as opposed to just a flat fee. OK, so that arguably that flat fee is a little bit high, but there are ways of getting it down almost to free. There are even free routes um, because of crypto economics uh, that you can actually utilize uh, to use crypto effectively for free. So from a payments perspective, it's actually a genuinely revolutionary tool, um, which also is more economical and cheaper. And I'm going to get back to economics later. So crypto is usable financial information. Crypto technology allows financial instruments, mainly money, to be treated as identical with information. Financial technology, although it feels modern, is actually using technology prior to the invention of the VHS tape. How would you feel if instead of Zoom these last two years, you've been working from home using a top of the range fax machine? OK, that's that's what the financial equivalent is of Zoom uh, and 
communications. OK, so if you wanted to have your meetings via fax, I'm sure uh, that would have felt the same as what the modern banking system is for moving money around the world. So working with a money as information model poses several problems. Mainly, how do you tell that the information is accurate? Well, with normal information, the problem is solved via corroboration. You hear something. So Elon Musk doesn't like Bitcoin anymore. And you either believe it or you don't. OK. And the more you interact with people who believe this statement and or see it directly for yourself with your own eyes, the more likely you are to believe it. That's where the pockets of bubbles of confirmation come in. You can have a narrative that isn't correct, but uh, enough people believe it to make it seem like it's obviously true. OK. And with money as information, this corroboration is carried out by computers who validate a digital signature encoded within the information. This is called consensus, which I'm going to talk about more later. But the point being that consensus doesn't need millions and millions and millions of data points. Consensus only needs one. And if two happen or three happen or four happen, the moment the incorrect one comes back, it invalidates the whole thing. So in that sense, it's built on the scientific method. OK, we have EMC squared and we know that EMC squared works because it's worked every single time that we've used it in history. The second it doesn't work, we throw out that theory, okay? Every single time we repeat e equals mc squared and we get the result that we expect or want, then that adds another uh, tally to that formula being correct. The same is happening with cryptocurrency, okay? The second it doesn't work, so that means that it's perpetually tested, okay? Every transaction is perpetually tested against, uh, for fraud, basically. So if you send, you know, if I sent you, hundred pounds three years ago that transaction would still be being tested today okay so it's a little bit inefficient and there are other blockchains which are coming around which shard and don't perpetually test obviously three years ago is is dead and buried uh, technically speaking but um there are networks out there that are continually testing for other reasons okay sometimes people want to reference transactions but sometimes accountants want to go back and validate a transaction and that needs to be perpetually tested okay so the internet is equivalent to instant free information there's a lot of information out there most of it is free um and we've got used to free information okay and if a lot of people believe false information there are a lot of examples. So, for example, COVID denies. I, I have COVID right now. I've tested positive. Um, so, you know, that would fly in the face of their belief. OK, but they would discount it. They would say, oh, the test is faulty. They would say, oh, he's not really experiencing symptoms. Uh, he must not have it, etc. OK, that's because people automatically uh, um, reduce any uh, opposing perspectives that they have. And we'll see this a little bit more later in regard to crypto. And the issue is that free information can also be inaccurate and misleading. In fact, inaccurate information tends to spread faster as it's more scandalous and hot. OK, so news media, as I'll talk about in a moment, they love a story which is controversial or spikes interest or gets you to go, oh, hang on a second. Um, that is usually a negative story that is fearful and fear inducing and scandalous. OK. Um, look at the sun with uh, in the UK, Matt Hancock, etc. That situation, that news spread like wildfire because it was so um, it was so it flies in the face of everyone, everything that everyone is trying to do. OK, separating accurate and inaccurate information is difficult and calls for critical thinking skills, which is something I'm going to return to in a minute. Literacy and numeracy were the focus of the 20th century, getting everyone to be literate and reading and uh, numerically able. OK, critical thinking, I think, is the equivalent skill that we need to exercise in the 21st century. You know, we can all read, we can all write, we can all talk. OK, but we can't critique the quality of those thoughts and the quality of those interactions. OK, and if we get better at that, then scams will go down. OK, uh, we'll be able to make better decisions and we'll be able to protect our wealth and protect our uh, livelihoods much, much better than just taking everything in and accepting everything at face value. That's me on a frequent evening when I'm uh, going through Reddit and looking at uh, different things and uh, looking at different articles. So let's talk a little bit about crypto news, why the news doesn't matter. Well, the news conservatively has declared crypto dead over 400 times in the last decade. 
Um, and let's not forget, it's the most powerful and best performing asset class in history still, even though everyone says that it's crashed and it's down and everything's negative at the moment. The news contributes to price volatility, which intimidates new investors. So new investors don't really want to get into crypto because they see it as really volatile. A few months ago, when it was just going up and up and up and up, there were a lot of new people who bought probably at $40,000, $50,000, $60,000 who are now underwater and regretting that decision, even though in 12, 18 months time, it might look like the best investment they've ever made. OK, the key point is that your decision should be independent of time and news media loves to focus on time elements okay the relationship between news and crypto is not as direct as you might think now you could play devil's advocate here and use the news to trade against okay that is one very good way to become extremely stressed out and not necessarily profitable which i'll talk about a little bit later in terms of micromanaging so my rule i'm going to generate seven rules my first rule is largely ignore the news the majority of what you hear in the news, especially regarding crypto, has an agenda, is deliberately biased or is just plain wrong. Remember, the primary mechanism of news is to generate interest and engage with the content. They want you to click. They want you to share. They want you to spread the narrative like a virus, uh, like a like epidemiology, literally as far and wide as possible. There is no better way to generate interest than using fear. Fear is the number one motivator for marketers. They want you to feel that you're inadequate, that you don't have the right in our world, you know, how you write investments, that you're not making money left, right and center every day. That is fear or that you're going to lose money left, right and center every day by being in the wrong place at the wrong time, owning the wrong assets, et cetera, et cetera. Fear is the dominant motivator. 98% of fear humans experience never transpires into what we actually fear. And the 2% that does is stuff that is relatively inane usually. And 1% is generally the stuff that, you know, is generally worrying like me having COVID at the moment. You know, if you told me a month ago that I have COVID, I would be thinking, oh, goodness gracious me, I'm terrified. What am I going to do? My actual experience has been anything. I, I literally I felt better this week than I did last week, believe it or not, just because of various other things like exercise and stuff. And I've kept on my exercise regime. So I actually feel better now than I did a week ago. So the fear doesn't really hold anything for me anymore. OK. As humans, we are wired to seek out and eliminate anxiety. We can't eliminate anxious news because it's never ending. You know, you read one news story and then you see another and then you see another and then you see another. It's called doom scrolling. It's what you do when you're literally looking for anxious material. And if your brain is wired for anxiety, which it should be, then you will seek out deliberately fearful information to scare you all the time. And that's what your brain will automatically go down that track. The news is a constant flow of anxiety with the odd positive story or high quality piece of journalism thrown in, which has a lower number of people read because they are hard work. It's hard work to read a long piece of journalism, which is well written and argues for a point. OK, it's akin to reading a, a, a nonfiction book. OK, that's why people don't generally tend to share that. They tend to share the images or the short pithy statements or the Twitter statements, that kind of thing, which one, don't have corroborative sources and two, um, are eliciting fear as quickly as possible and in general it's better to use the maximum if it's important enough you will find out anyway for example i don't really watch the news but i know where bitcoin is at the moment okay um i know that elon musk has turned around and said now he actually wants to invest in cryptocurrency uh bitcoin again because he's less now concerned about the ecological uh, background narrative to it i know that the fca are um, hunting down on Binance at the moment for nefarious reasons. Um, so I have actually picked up these major news stories, but I haven't actually read a newspaper or looked at articles. I've just kind of been on the grapevine. I've been on you know, social media and social media will tell you the really important stories that you need to know. Or I follow certain people who I trust and, and know, um, and they start talking about certain key things. But what they do is they filter out the stuff that is just purely there for fear and concern okay and we actually focus on the really important things and turns out the most important things usually um don't really affect the market okay um which we'll see a little bit later so this is a classic example of a, of a news story that i saw on facebook this week it's from the independent and the headline is youtube star and rapper invest in cryptocurrency less than a year ago OK, and it's KSI reveals he lost a staggering amount of money in Bitcoin investment. This is something that comes up on my newsfeed 
it's targeting anyone and everyone pretty much and it's got crypto bad basically that's that's what that's what the the story is okay the headline is designed to promote fear by not qualifying the exact amount of crypto other than it was staggering what's staggering to someone is 500 pounds loss staggering to some people maybe is you know five million yep yeah, maybe maybe not okay it makes the time frame recent so less than a year ago which draws in new crypto investors who may be insecure remember those people at 40 50 60 thousand dollars invested they're going to be looking at this and going oh my goodness i've written all my money off basically okay they're going to click this they're going to look at it it specifically references both bitcoin and cryptocurrency probably for seo purposes okay so there's cryptocurrency in the main title and there's bitcoin in the actual news article as well so they're getting both of those uh areas okay i'm actually going to deconstruct this article and actually show you what it actually said and also propose an alternative headline so ksi um said i put two million pounds into bitcoin and i've made seven million but now i've lost it all it's mental okay so i essentially leveraged myself and i kind of over leveraged myself to a point where i lost money because of it i got liquidated because of the bitcoin crash I've lost 7 million, 5 million of which was profit, and I'm still fully in crypto. So alternative headline might be KSI loses profitable Bitcoin investment due to leverage and he would invest again. Or KSI makes 5 million profit in months only to lose it all margin trading with no stops. OK, so basically what he's done is he's not bought Bitcoin. That's the crucial thing here. He did not buy Bitcoin. He bought a contract which tracked the price of Bitcoin, okay, made seven, made five million pounds profit, didn't sell, probably through greed, okay, we're all greedy, okay, on some level we're all greedy, okay, I'm not detracting anything from that, okay, and then as the market came down, he over leveraged himself, so he borrowed more money in order to push the price further, okay, and when the price got back to his break even point, it cuts them out of the market okay happens time and time again 80 percent of people lose money trading this way okay it's a really really difficult way to trade using margin okay you have to know really what you're doing you can make a fortune if you get it right but 80 percent of the time you will get it wrong okay that's just the way a human psychology works okay so you see how the article is deliberately biased into framing crypto in a negative light even though he made five million profit in a few months that's probably better than his other careers okay for that short space of time but because people focus it on a narrow mindset and then think ah it's all over now i'm not going to do that again they they get bitten and they they walk away from it okay who's to say that tomorrow he can't put another two million in and make another five million and cash out cash it out this time because he's learned from that experience okay there's a lot of people in crypto who are getting burnt and then never going back because they're taking on too much risk and they're too eager to make money um, and they're not thinking about the underlying risks and underlying circumstances. If he had bought Bitcoin uh, in November last year when it was around ten thousand dollars, okay, and sold it today, he'd have doubled his money. Okay, he'd still have four million. But because he added margin and leverage to the facility, he's not got anything now. So Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies have this weird paradoxical element of uh, fight uh, of. of, of um, hurting the greedy okay or hurting people who want to make money as quickly as possible and rewarding people with patience okay so these are two books that i recommend you read i'm going to be making some suggestions throughout this uh, talk today full by randomness a fantastic book uh, which talks about price um speculation and how it is essentially random and also talks about the news a little bit and then stop reading the news by ralph de belly which is a brilliant book um, about why news media shouldn't be a thing really in your life and how you'll pick up most things uh, just on the grapevine anyway. Okay, two books there. So rule two for cryptocurrency investing, look for and understand utility. The best way to value a cryptocurrency is via utility. Ask yourself, what problem does the crypto project solve and how well does it solve it? For example, Bitcoin was the first and only for two years until Litecoin way to transfer value digitally. Today, there is an argument that Bitcoin may no longer be the best way to transfer value economically and ecologically because there are better cryptocurrencies out there that do the job cheaper and uh, more environmentally friendly. Uh, investors are usually either Bitcoin maximalists or Bitcoin minimalists. OK, and you can be on a spectrum between those. OK, personally, I'm a little bit crypto agnostic. I will look at any project and if it derives value and if it looks like a good opportunity to invest, I will go with that. OK. 
Bitcoin continues to perform well, mainly due to a first mover effect, mainstream popular consciousness and the complexity of alternative crypto projects. People get Bitcoin. They can understand it. It's relatively simple. But as soon as you start looking at other crypto projects, they're really they can get very, very complicated very, very quickly. And also they're multidisciplinary. So sometimes utility can be more luck than judgment. Uh, there are numerous crypto projects that have made millionaires uh, who you'd never think uh, would have done. Uh, so there's some selections here that I've just taken. Um, all of these cryptocurrencies have effectively made someone somewhere in the world a millionaire, okay, or even a billionaire in the case of Dogecoin, okay. Um, all of them I would have avoided with a barge pole uh, on the first day that they were launched, uh, just because they didn't match my frame of reference. But uh, there are usually people out there who are very willing to remind you that luck can sometimes work better than judgment with cryptocurrencies with this new nascent market, basically. Okay, anything new, there's probably going to be a few uh, black swans that happen. Okay, and these are just some of those. Okay. Once again, two books, uh, Crypto Assets, brilliant book, um, which basically goes through how to um, work out what to invest in, and Blockchain Revolution, which is more of a narrative, generic uh, book about how cryptocurrencies are changing. Uh, technology and society in general. Rule three, examine the tokenomics. So when the utility looks promising, when you like the sound of the idea and the problem that it solves, you next need to understand what the price potential is, and that uses tokenomics. Because the majority of crypto projects have a finite amount of units, it's possible to calculate an expected value based on the amount of capital in the project divided by the entire number of units. It gets a little bit complicated, for projects like uh, Ethereum, um, where the amount of cryptocurrency isn't capped at the moment, okay? And there are some other projects where the cap is non-existent, okay? But you can take the total number of units now and then extrapolate it out and also look at the release rates, okay? For example, Bitcoin, there will only be ever 21 million coins in existence. Therefore, if we assume that the total market capitalization of Bitcoin will exceed $10 trillion in the next five years, then the expected value is $476,190, okay? May I remind you that uh, my last talk, Bitcoin was already worth over $2 trillion. So all it's got to do is five times, which is roughly the estimate of gold at the moment. So if the entire gold market, not looking at any other precious metal like platinum, palladium, silver, etc., if just the gold market moved into cryptocurrency and went with, went with Bitcoin, we would have almost half a million dollar Bitcoin, okay? Remember those graphs from the beginning of the talk as well about the, the amount of money in circulation growing as well? So that's gonna increase the likelihood that these assets are going to increase in value over the long term, okay? To understand the utility, how do you do that? Well, you read the white paper, okay? This is the Bitcoin white paper, or the start of the Bitcoin white paper, that explains how the cryptocurrency works, why it exists, and makes a rationale. It's like an article, it's like a journal article, but specifically for cryptocurrencies. If the project you're investing in or thinking of investing in doesn't have one of these, avoid it, okay, until it does. And if it's a low quality one, avoid it as well, okay? Um, you can get a lot of information from a, a white paper. There was one white paper which was very well crafted, which was a scam, which is one coin. Um, I talk about it a little bit on my YouTube channel. Uh, but one coin um, had a deliberately confusing and uh, opaque white paper. If you read it, and even as not a technologically uh, sophisticated individual, you still can't understand it. White papers are generally intended for audiences worldwide and uh, for different types of individuals they're not necessarily uh, technical papers okay if you can't understand it get someone to explain it to you or if they can't explain it to you then it's probably not going to be worth investing okay that was the thing with one coin it was very very confusing i looked at it and i couldn't make head or tail of it it was promising 15 percent returns per month forever and that just doesn't stack up that doesn't doesn't make sense Two books, uh, Crypto Asset Investing in the Age of Autonomy is quite a heavy uh, short book, but it's quite good in terms of uh, demonstrating how to invest in cryptos autonomously. And then we have the Bitcoin Standard, once again, another textbook like book, um, which explains how money is going to be moving or banking is going to be moving towards a Bitcoin standard as opposed to a gold standard or fiat standard effectively. Okay.
So four, examine the intangibles or value options. So when valuing, uh, this is from the world of um, actually uh, small startup technology companies and how they're valued, we can view, view those as value options, okay, to help make the decisions. A value option is usually a subjective or qualitative attribute that doesn't confirm to statistical or quantitative analysis. For example, does a CEO have previous technological development experience? Uh, what's turnover of the employees or contractors? How much is the crypto used for genuine purpose? Okay, is the crypto held in an account somewhere until it's uh, going to go up and then it's going to be massively sold by the people who originally invested in it, okay? Estimating these things can be tricky, but answers are usually available or at least relatable. For example, Bitcoin has no employees, but it does have thousands of volunteer developers and miners who have a vested interest in promoting and maintaining the Bitcoin network. OK, you see this when China decides to ban crypto miners, the price takes a drop. OK, until more demand comes in and we have a resurgence. That's what's happening to the price, I believe, at the moment is that China is cracking down. Regulators around the world are cracking down on mining technology, mining products, one for ecological reasons and two because uh, they're concerned about the growth. OK, and that's why the price is a little bit on the downside. One of the reasons why the uh, Bitcoin price is on the down at the moment. So uh, no books, just read the white papers okay, of the projects you intend to invest in. And you can use whitepaper.io um, or the main website of the project or Google to find them. Okay. Five, critique your thinking, especially with narratives. So unlike some other markets, there's a lot of people that invest in crypto because of a narrative. They feel it in their core. They are passionate about it, like I am. Um, fiat currency will collapse at some point in the 21st century and crypto will thrive. That's one of the narratives that I've kind of been using throughout this talk. Um, it has elements of truth. It has elements of falsehood. OK, depending on who you talk to. But it is a narrative, an opinion. OK, and some facts confirm it, some facts refute it. OK, that's the important thing about these. None of these, even the false ones that I'm going to say, none of these are incorrect. OK, they all have elements of truth to them, but some are more right than others. And it depends on who you read and who you research, basically. Banks or governments have too much control over our lives. Crypto can do this better. OK, um, my friend made X investing in Y. I'm going to do the same. OK, that's a narrative. Inflation is eroding my capital. I want to invest in something deflationary. OK, that is a narrative. And these are all narratives in favor of crypto. Unfortunately, there are more narratives that uh, don't favor crypto. And let's just have a look at some of these. You'll probably know some of these already or seen articles about them. Crypto is mainly used by international crime organizations. Crypto is bad for the environment. Crypto is a scam and you will lose all your money. Crypto is a higher risk than any other type of investment. Crypto can be made illegal, catastrophically regulated at any point. Crypto has no intrinsic value and crypto is not safe, cannot be made safe. It's too complicated for you to understand. OK. Uh, aside from the patronizing tone of many of those narratives, OK, they all have elements of truth to them, but they are all they are all uh, falsifiable. OK, they are all able to be falsified. OK, yes, crypto is relatively speaking high risk. OK, but then any asset that's only 10 years old is relatively high risk. What's the reward like? OK, the reward is mind blowing. Fantastic. OK, I'm happy to put some money in because the risk versus reward ratio is fantastic okay yeah buying a property might be safer but it's not it's not going to do a thousand percent for you in the next 10 years okay everything has context and what usually happens is that these narratives are taken out of context and are written into those articles and news pieces that you see and they're biased okay yes crypto might be bad for the environment but then it's blasting off to space uh, in a rocket that you've designed over the last 20 years. Is that bad for the environment? Oh, yes, it is. But why is it justified? OK, because you paid for it yourself. OK, fantastic. OK, what's the purpose? What's the utility of it? Oh, I just wanted to go to space since I was the age of four. OK, we start to see these narratives not stacking up, but people are going, well, what's crypto done for the world? OK, it's made governments and um, other author authoritarian societies stand up and be thinking, actually, I can't control the fiat currency system. It's made banks start to look like they're more competitive. It's made banks suddenly become your best friend. Have you seen these adverts going around the world at the moment? Banks are suddenly your best friend because they want you to be able to feel that you can't take control of your money, that you need someone else to talk to and to do everything with. OK, so they decided not to go down the route of attacking cryptocurrency on a technological basis, but actually they're going by the human element of it. OK, which obviously crypto can't compete with. But then do you need a human elephant, a human element if you are able to do everything yourself? 
two books narrative economics brilliant book um, about how stories go viral and drive major economic events there's quite a, a big section in there on bitcoin and its narratives and i like the fact that it's not uh, robert uh, schiller is not a crypto enthusiast and he's very good at keeping the line uh, staying on his toes basically and the art of thinking clearly again by rob Debelli, a brilliant book about critiquing your own thinking and uh, knowing how to choose what to do with your own thinking Rule six of seven, begin with the end in mind. Ask yourself, why are you investing in crypto? And be honest about the answer. It's fine to want to get rich quick or be slightly anarchist or iconoclastic. Uh, politicians don't do too much anymore to come back this type of thinking. If you are fascinated by the technology or by the social cultural phenomenon of crypto, then all the better. This is going to fuel your passion and this will make you a better investor because you'll be reading more, you'll be learning more, you'll be discovering more. If you're looking for financial freedom, then the crypto world could be the vehicle to help you get there, but it will probably take more than just buying a lot of cheap crypto to get you there. As Stephen Covey said, you have to begin with the end in mind. In this way, the price doesn't really matter. It is a means to an end. Buy it cheap, sell it high. Cheap is obviously always relative. Bitcoin right now is cheap, okay? But it's not cheap if you looked at it 10 years ago, okay? But it is cheap if you looked at back at it in six months. And it is cheap if it goes to half a million dollars uh, in the next 10 years. Sell it high. So buy it cheap, sell it high. So the two books, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, brilliant book. There are obviously seven other rules in there. I've just picked one of them, um, begin with the end in mind. And Safe Strategies for Financial Freedom by uh, Vaikan Tharp who also has written several really good trading books as well. Rule seven, think more in terms of risk and less in terms of reward, and particularly with regard to scams. The most profitable individuals in crypto bought an extremely risky asset and then largely forgot about it. Understanding risk is key to this. Can you afford to lose $100 for the chance to make 1,000? If you can, fantastic. Psychologically writing off most of your crypto most of your crypto capital will ironically make you more profitable and micromanaging your crypto investing is unlikely to be profitable in the long term no matter how good a trader you are you know if you're going to day trade crypto you need to be really really on it okay uh, you know if you're going to do that for 100 days straight it's not going to be fun you're going to be making maybe a little bit of money but you know all it takes is for one bad day like ksi for example uh, and you lose your entire account okay uh, i don't like people who call cryptocurrency gambling but that is a form of gambling okay where you're going oh i'm going to make a little bit a little bit a little bit and then suddenly you get wiped out it's a black swan event okay um good so just a couple of tweets from history well bitcoin is stabilized at almost exactly 14 dollars a coin i'm tired of waiting for a jump so i'm taking the loss and getting my cash back that was made in uh, 2011 <coughs> just sold 100 bitcoins for 220 dollars i tripled my investment buyer was happy 100 BTC are worth $260 right now. Okay, so these people <coughs> have the chance to be millionaires, multimillionaires, but they sold out too soon. They were impatient. They didn't think it through. Slash, they weren't happy with the risk. So why isn't crypto mainstream yet? If all these good things are happening, well, look where the money is and look where the power is, basically. Okay. <coughs> and also, it's a lack of knowledge. Crypto is a complicated and highly multidisciplinary. Crypto takes an already dense and alienating topic, finance, and adds crypto cryptography, computer science, psychology, sociology, physics, economics, and political science, to name a few. I believe that anyone can understand and use crypto well. If you're able to do online banking, if you're able to you know, manage a job, um, manage a business especially, then you can do crypto, okay? And fortunately, a lack of knowledge can be cured. So I have developed over the last uh, six months a course, a crypto course uh, and a, a membership uh, website called Class. OK, uh, these are really early days at the moment. I'm just developing this. OK, and basically the course is uh, over 100 videos of how to uh, get the best out of crypto. OK, how to invest wisely, how to avoid scams, how to even do your taxes, um, how to uh, profit, how to trade, etc. OK. Um, and class is a membership where you can reach out to me and ask me questions whenever you like, basically. So if you come up with something, and you, you're not sure about it, you can ask me. <coughs> this is the page. Um, and there are seven modules, okay? Buy and sell, secure and store, cash flow and cash back. I have a cash back card. I get 5% cash back uh, on anything I spend, paid for in cryptocurrency through crypto.com. Psychology and crypto, CFI and DeFi, tracking attacks and trading and investing, okay?
So the Introduction Investor Program has over 70 topics, um, how to lower fees, how to back up and store your crypto, crypto psychology, how to get cash back, how to read charts. Basically, if it's about crypto, it's in there. OK, uh, this is a this is a comprehensive but basic program. It's uh, it's massively comprehensive, but it's designed to get you up to speed with cryptocurrency as quickly as possible without all much jargon, or without too much confusion, basically. So there are three membership options. Lifetime access for roughly five grand. OK, Crypto Convinced. That's if you don't want to pay anything any, anymore and you want lifetime access. Then there is annual access for 497. And then for people who are just wanting to get started in the world of crypto, there is monthly access for £49 a month. And you get everything. You get access to class. You get access to me. You get access to the course. OK, and you can learn at your own pace, basically. OK. So. One of my clients who was tested, obviously, last time I did this talk, this is from this last time, but he had turned 30K into over 100K very, very easily with the market movements that happened. Obviously, at the moment, that's a little bit of a different picture with the markets where they are. But uh, the point being that we can actually manipulate the markets into a way that we want to do them. And it's not as difficult as you think it is. No margin trading using that either. Purely 100% buys, spot purchases. So class, basically, I'm going to be adding to this in the future, but it's priority and ad free uh, crypto professor viewings, uh, discounts on certain things. You can get to email me and ask me questions. There's a email. It's a 10 percent discount on future courses. Basically, it's a membership group for anyone who's really wanting to get the best out of cryptocurrency. Class costs 99 pounds for lifetime access. OK, so it's one off payment and then your subscription goes on top. OK, so if you're paying 49 pounds a month, you pay 99 pounds and then 49, etc. OK, but for a limited period until the end of this month, until the 1st of August, you can get your first month free just by using the code free month um, on the crypto classes website. I apologize. It should say free org AUG. OK, not free month. OK, so free org, free AUG. If you need that, just drop me an email. OK, on the crypto classes dot com and you can get access to that for just paying the class fee and then have your first month completely free of the crypto course. And thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, Peter. Uh, if anybody does have any questions, please do feel free to put them in a the chat or the Q&A or raise a hand and we can get your questions. It doesn't have to be specifically about the topics today, uh, but anything personally crypto related, feel free to ask. Peter, can you just to go back over from the first uh, um, first series we did um, with the analogy about crypto still in the harbour and people thinking that the ship has sailed and, and where we are now with it? Sure. OK, so. The last time I did a talk, um, I would have told anyone who wants to get into cryptocurrency, don't buy here. OK, um, I actually said in the talk and it's on YouTube, you can go and watch it, that I was not really interested in buying anything around these prices because it was everything was too high. OK, um, right now we're at the point where everyone's going, oh, crypto's not going anywhere. It's boring, which is ironically the best place to start investing. OK. When everyone's kind of not really excited about it, when everyone's kind of avoiding it, when everyone's not really sure where the bottom is and whether it's going to go down to fifteen thousand dollars Bitcoin specifically, or whether it's going to go down to twenty five thousand dollars, basically, if you bought here, you could double your money by the time that we were back at uh, the all time high only a few months ago. Okay, there are a lot of people who have bought and stayed in the markets. Okay, there are quite a few more who will sell out down here and write crypto off as a loss making endeavor because they might have to sell for other reasons okay or they might sell out of fear okay they want to have the philosophy that i've talked about in this talk uh to hold them to the mast uh as they get through that okay so my analogy is that um the boat is still in the harbor okay earlier this year we raided the anchor okay we're now going to be setting sail uh as mainstream adoption increases and people become less focused on the negative narratives and more focused on the positive narratives, of which there are many. Uh, I've only included a few in this uh, talk today. Given that it's a, an unregulated product as far as the financial institutions are concerned, do you think that the banks will look at this at some point and go, actually, we need to start trading it ourselves? 
The problem is that the philosophy doesn't match up to the banks. That's why crypto hasn't been adopted by mainstream banks, and let, uh, apart from with really, really high net worth individuals, which is where you see these news stories coming out from time to time. Okay, they they decide it's worth it for really high net worth individuals because they're asking for it and they can offer it. But for mainstream, it just doesn't make sense because how is a bank going to tell you that you can trade cryptocurrency where the central ethos is that you can take care of your own money? It just doesn't make sense because they don't want you to take care of your own money because they want you to have their assets with them. They don't want you to have your assets yourself. And the entire idea behind cryptocurrency, if you look at the Bitcoin white paper, the very first white paper that was ever published, is it is giving power back to the people and people don't need regulation. OK, the, the system regulates itself. OK, I in my other job as a psychotherapist, I am a regulated psychotherapist, but I'm not a fully regulated psychotherapist because you have to tick certain boxes and be certain a certain type of person to do that. OK, you have to go to a certain degree course and that kind of thing. But in many industries, the regulated people are usually the ones that are the most problematic. Look at the banking sector, the most highly regulated sector in the world. There's not a news story that goes by, you know, in a week where there's not some scandal happening in the most regulated sector in the world. So regulation is good to a point, but then the, the people involved in the regulation look and go, well, how can we get around that? What's the loopholes? You know, there are multi-million pound companies worldwide who are looking for loopholes all the time in this regulation to get around it, basically. So regulation is only as good as the circumstances happen to be at the time. And as soon as something else comes along, they will get around it. So I'm a little bit of a regulation uh skeptic i suppose i i appreciate and respect it but also at the same time i'm a little bit skeptical of its utility i've got a couple of questions coming in if that's okay uh so there's a question from john boke um who's but what coin or crypto would you go into at current prices for a five to ten year plan and why bitcoin because it's popular doge because it's everyone is mad or ethereum as it does this and that out of those three I would go for Ethereum. Um, I think that Ethereum's use case is much, much bigger than Bitcoin's. Dogecoin, I don't like Dogecoin personally. I think it's, although it's done fantastically well, and I'll, you know, if I, I sometimes have to eat my eat my shoes on these kind of things. Uh, yes, you can make money in Dogecoin, and there have been many people who've made money in Dogecoin, but I did a video where I said I wasn't going to invest in it just because I don't see the utility. Yes, you could argue that it's exchanging between people, but then there's Ripple, you know, there's Crow, for example. There's many, many, many other types of cryptocurrency that can do that. Um, can, can you tell us where you would go for a five to ten year plan then? Rather than just I'll those three. Ciscoin, Ciscoin SYS. Um, it's got more utility than many other crypto projects that I know of. And uh, recently it was up at uh, 70 cents. It's now less than 10 cents. And that's only because they did a major product announcement and everyone got a bit excited. Um, there's nothing changed fundamentally. In actual fact, it's got better fundamentally, but the price has declined to a point where I can't quite believe it. Um, so, yeah, that would be my recommendation at present. Thank you, Peter. I hope that helps. John, there's a question from Warren. Uh, the question is, uh, where's it gone? Really interesting. Enjoying learning about this. Uh, with crypto being tech based, what stops future tech uncapping or changing it so supply goes beyond its current finite level or simply rendering it obsolete? So there is with uh, certain types of crypto, notably ERC20 and Ethereum tokens, there are ways to change the market, uh, the amount of units. OK, but with other cryptocurrency projects like Bitcoin, for example, like uh, many other cryptocurrencies, they are to change the value would involve starting an entirely new blockchain. OK, so we are looking for if you really want to invest in something that is not going to be manipulated further down the road is uh, a, a Genesis block, which actually dictates the amount of cryptocurrency that can exist. Um, and that, you know, we've got Litecoin, for example, that has that. OK, many of the older more traditional cryptocurrencies have that many of the new ones are just copies of other blockchain technologies um so you're looking for that kind of thing so yeah in order to change a blockchain network it would involve either stopping 
and destroying the blockchain and restarting it and therefore losing all value or starting an entirely new one. OK, look at the difference between Bitcoin cash and Bitcoin normal, uh, Bitcoin you know, regular, and you'll see the difference in stopping and starting a blockchain. Similarly, look at Ethereum Classic versus Ethereum. OK, Ethereum Classic was obviously uh, a copy of the Ethereum blockchain, but fewer people follow it and fewer people support it. So therefore, the price is much, much lower than Ethereum. Thank you very much. I hope that was useful for you, Warren. And a question from Ian. Um, where again do you see the XRP debacle ending and how will the SEC change the way the crypto market is regulated? Sure. OK, so I think that this is in the grand narrative of everything that's going on at the moment with regulators deciding to weigh in uh, almost on behalf of banks and put their foot down on cryptocurrency. I can see the SEC situation, no matter how well ripple labs play it i can see them being used as an example i mean on the face of it they have they haven't been particularly careful they've been a bit brazen in my opinion uh selling 1.3 billion dollars of effectively what looks like securities um with under the under the f uh, under the sec's nose so that's that's a little bit of an issue and i think that the sec are going to view this as a one-shot only deal where they can take cryptocurrency effectively to task and try and make the most out of it the price at the moment isn't really reflecting that 43 pence uh, last time i checked so around about 50 52 53 cents um so that's you know people aren't really worried it may be the case that they leave the us market and that will get around the logistic issue but yeah i can see the uh i can see ripple lab surviving long term but they might have to change their business model slash leave the US market altogether, as we've seen with some other cryptocurrency projects. Thank you so much, Peter. I told you he was good. So thank you again for coming back for the second part in the series. We look forward to doing another one with you later on in the year. Um, as far as Legacy Club is concerned, we have our last event of the month next Tuesday, uh, CBD, the controversial science. We have two CBD business owners uh, to joining us to give us their view on why it's controversial and the the good, the bad, the ugly of the CBD industry. So please join us for that next Tuesday. Jump onto legacyclub.co.uk under the events page and you'll find out more information on that. Uh, Peter, as always, it's a great pleasure to have you join us and we look forward to the third part in our series in the future. And thank, thank you again you for everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.